Hey everyone, so something I've been thinking about that I wanted to make a little video on. Um, got a video called, what is it called? Uh, is Hare Krishna still a cult? Um, surprise, surprise, the answer is yes. It's still a cult because you are explicitly and implicitly encouraged to distance yourself from your family and your friends to um, pursue a life that is um, very harmful to your long-term well-being. Uh, psychologically, basic psychological needs are not being met. You're rejecting all forms of pleasure and mat material affection, material relationships, you know, the things that people actually need to be happy. Um, and most importantly, you're asked to surrender your life to a guru, a living guru. There are people, of course, you probably know this because you know something about Hare Krishna already if you're watching this, there are, but there are people, if you don't, that you are supposed to worship an actual person. You're supposed to worship as good as God, accept his word in your life as good as the word of God. Of course, there's the teachings of Prabhupada, which are not supposed to be questioned. You're supposed to accept them as the word of God and all that stuff. Okay, so for those reasons and so many more, uh, it's clearly a cult. Um, however, I did want to uh, address this point, which is there is a, a perception, and I think, you know, this is something that just crystallized in my mind and something I've been thinking about. There's a perception that Hare Krishna is less cultish than, say, it was in the 70s. So uh, Prabhupada came to America in 1965, and it was this plucky young band of hippies and whatever uh, became a worldwide organization throughout the 70s and um, you know became famous and you know book distribution devotees on the streets and their robes chanting and playing merdanga distributing books you know living in temples communally all that stuff so that sounds very cultish in the sense of like the, the communal living aspect of it and it is um, it was but there's a really important sense in which Hare Krishna is now, so nowadays people are more likely, you know, your average member is much more likely to live outside the temple than in a temple. You know, in the early 70s, essentially everyone lived in a temple. Nowadays, you know, only a small percentage of people live in temples. Okay. So you might think, well, we've gone from extremely cultish, everyone living in a temple to not very cultish, people having careers and families and whatnot. And um, there's a sort of truth to that line of reasoning. Um, however, there's a really important um, way in which Hare Krishna is actually much, much more cultish than it was in that period of time. So let's let's dig into that. So maybe you've watched some movies on cults. There's been some really good documentaries uh, lately. Highly, highly recommend them, um, especially the Scientology one. Uh, these, these are both on HBO. There's a Scientology one and a Nexium one. There was another Nexium one. I didn't see the one that's not on HBO. You can only have so many streaming services and only so much time, but both of those are fantastic documentaries. And what becomes clearer as you uh, watch these documentaries, the Nexium one is a, it's a, it's a season. I think they're going to make a second season. The Scientology one is just like a whatever one and a half, two hour uh, documentary. Is the the people that get involved, the way people get involved, they have no idea what they're getting involved with, right? For them, it's just a way to, um, you know, relieve stress, uh, to, you know, improve their productivity, to achieve their goals, that type of stuff, right? Um, Nexium, their sort of flagship program, the, the one that they pull people in with, I think it was called Executive Success Program, ESP. I don't know, that was one of their programs. I think it's that was their first. And um, that is exactly what ISKCON has done over the past uh, 20-ish years, you know, especially. They sort of made this transformation. So, you know, in the 70s, there was a lot of hippies running around who were willing to join. Um, a weird religion. And, and these were spiritual seekers. And that's why I say, you know, one thing you can say about the people who joined ISKCON in the 70s is most of them, you know, some of them were just crazy and, you know, homeless and couldn't figure out a way to survive in society. And they liked the free food and, 
they needed the free food and place to stay. That was certainly some people. A lot of people were genuinely spiritual seekers. You know, that was still a thing in society. And that was a unique moment in history when you had young people growing up and they were rejecting their parents' values. Now, most of them went into secularism, but a few of them ha had that religious impulse. So they grew up in sort of religious families and they had that religious impulse, but they didn't identify with the religion of their parents. So they were looking for some other spiritual truth. And so that idea and that sort of um, that psychological need or whatever, that was a, a part of the cultural milieu in that period of history. That is no longer the case, right? Kids these days do not grow up looking for God or the truth or, you know, no one grows up as a spiritual seeker these days. It just, in America, it's just not where the culture is at. Young people are growing up focused, rightly so, on social justice and environmentalism, and fighting racism, you know, making the world a better place for humans and, you know, a, a livable place. I forget better, just livable, habitable for, uh, them, you know, themselves and their, you know, potential children or future generations. So, um, so what ISCON has done, you know, so anyway, so Outreach was mostly done, you know, in the 70s through the chanting in the streets, the passing out of books with people dressed up in full Hare Krishna regalia. Then it switched to more of uh, just fundraising and people dressed up, uh, dressing in, you know, uh, secular clothes, non-devotee clothes um, to raise money and oftentimes not even selling books. Um, then that, you know, then people moved out of temples and kind of, I'd say there's kind of a, a dormant period, a latency almost in the kind of late 80s, 90s. And then there was kind of a renewed push towards outreach with some of the second generation being involved, some of the newer gurus, especially Radhanath Swami being coming to prominence, um, certainly in America, at least. I can't speak to the worldwide Hare Krishna movement. I mean, I know a fair amount, but I don't know exactly all the contours uh, year by year in other parts of the world. Um, so what did... The Hare Krishna movement do. Um, so a lot of this has to do honestly with Radha Swami. I think he was a big innovator in this space, so to speak. Um, he started out in the, I guess, when was it? Probably would have, I don't remember. I think maybe he started in the late seventies, definitely, or maybe it was mostly early eighties. Uh, he was doing these uh, college outreach programs, but he was just doing uh, vegetarian cooking classes, right? So here you see a really big shift away from, uh, you know, here's a book about how to, you know, find God to, you know, hey, let me teach you about uh, vegetarian cooking. It's healthy. It's good for you, right? You're not uh, presenting yourself accurately as to who you are and what your goals are in that relationship. And you're using this thing that people are interested in to build a relationship with them. Then once you have that relationship, once your hooks are into them, then you gradually introduce more and more of the religious aspects. Now, I know about this process very well. Uh, Radha Swami did it to me and he, I learned it from him. I did it to other people. I, I was always a little hesitant and I was never, I was great at meeting people and giving people a positive impression of Hare Krishna. Um, I was always hesitant to sort of <laughs> pull people along for that next step. It wasn't my style really, but I certainly learned how to do it. Um, that emotional manipulation. And, it, you know, what does that mean? It really means just love bombing, just giving people attention and affection and bringing them into a community and making them feel valued and appreciated and making them feel special, right? That's what we all want. So Radha Swami really started that with his cooking classes um, based out of New Vrindavan in the early 80s. Uh, he taught it to his disciples, both in India and America. Me and some of my friends, we were doing vegetarian cooking classes based or vegan cooking classes based out of New Vrindavan. Uh, there was a group of uh, people in New York City what, in what's you known as the Bhakti Center. Uh, they were doing uh, the vegetarian cooking classes. And you know, since then, they've progressed a lot to doing a lot of stuff out of the Bhakti Center itself. Um, seminars, cooking classes, yoga classes. So when you look at the main places where outreach is happening in uh, ISKCON, what, what form is it? It's yoga classes, yoga instructors. It's uh, vegetarian cooking classes. Uh, it's the, the student lunch program in Gainesville. And I think they've expanded to uh, other campuses around, uh, in the Flor around Florida. Right? These are all, what do all these things have in common? The, these are people not really presenting themselves accurately. These are people engaging in activity as a way of meeting people 
and it's sort of, you know, it's a sale, it's a, it's a classic sales technique, right? It's a funnel. You get people going in, you know, at the, you know, this is the first step, you, you cast a wide net, try and meet a lot of people. Then you've got the next step where, you know, you invite some of those people or you invite everyone to like something a little more, a little more, a little more, and then it ends, you know, with initiation. That's it's a classic sales technique. You know, every business, every you know, online business uses these free offer, this, that, get people hooked, get people in the door. And, and it's what cults do. That is, that is what cults do. That's no one volunteers to join a cult and no one volunteers to be celibate for the rest of their life, to cut connections with their family and friends, to totally destroy their career, to sabotage their financial prospects for the rest of their life. No one does that. No one signs up for that. No one wants that. No young adult goes out into the world thinking, you know, I'd really like to be poor for the rest of my life. Um, and I'd like to, you know, reject all my friends and family and, you know, just hang out with these people. No one does that. No one wants that. But if you can make people feel part of the group, then, and they identify with that group, they're willing to do anything. It's basic human psychology. My favorite summary of human psychology, which I tell all my classes over and over again in my psychology classes, humans need a tribe like bees need a hive. We are tribal creatures. If you can bring someone into your tribe, you can, they will do anything for you, right? And that's what the main form of outreach is currently with the Hare Krishna religion in the United States. Um, I know there's elsewhere to some extent as well, um, but I'm not as clear on the details of that. So I can't speak too much to it, but I'm pretty sure, you know, you have the same thing, sort of yoga classes, meditation classes, vegetarian cooking classes, that type of stuff happening. I know in New Zealand, Australia, they were doing these things, yoga lounges, although that was a while ago. I don't know how functional they are still, but I'm pretty sure this is a general worldwide trend, certainly in India, where ISKCON is the biggest and Radha Swami is the biggest guru. I mean, it's crazy to look at what his disciples are doing there. I mean, obviously, you know, <laughs> if you haven't seen this, uh, videos of Gorgo Paul or Jay Shetty, uh, who's based out of the UK, uh, Radha Swami Acolyte. Um, I used to know Gorgo Paul. <laughs> I lived in the Chaupati Ashram with Gorgo Paul. Uh, I don't know if we're ever friends, um, but, you know, I spent a fair amount of time with him. I observed him every day for a period of a couple of years. Uh, he is, he looks nothing and talks nothing and sounds nothing like he did back then. He does not even sound like a Hare Krishna with his Facebook page and all that stuff. And if you haven't seen it, um, <laughs> go watch it. But, you know, it's it's a very logical conclusion. Of course, Radha Swami himself with his book and the interviews he does and stuff like that. And And I totally get it. Like, the reasoning when you're inside it, you know, you think, okay, well, this is how I can bring people to Christian consciousness, right? And whatever brings people to Christian consciousness, it's a very utilitarian style of reasoning, is a good thing. So you can justify anything in that way. Now, utilitarianism notoriously has its flaws. You tend to um, violate people's rights when you use utilitarian style thinking. Utilitarianism does not recognize individual rights. There is nothing that is absolutely morally wrong in utilitarianism, as long as it's for the greater good. So I think this is a real problem. It's uh, frankly despicable, uh, the way that, you know, that kind of emotional manipulation. And it makes ISKCON, despite seeming more normal, I mean, look, these, you know, Scientology, you know, the, the, Scientology and Nexium, they're very, very professional looking on the surface, right? And that's what ISKCON has done. It's become more professional looking on the outside, but it still has that cultish core that, you know, the core, you know, no, you know, no, your any entertainment is bad, any pleasure is bad, sex is bad, attachments, right, are bad. Attachments, humans need a tribe like bees in your hive. We need emotional attachments. That is the most basic thing humans need. Loneliness is more dangerous for you than smoking. It is a greater risk factor for cancer than smoking, being lonely, right? Atta material attachments are not a bad thing, right? Relatedness, the need to belong is the most fundamental human need. I'm gonna do a video on that uh, next, but anyhow, that is a cult. Anything that tells you human relationships are bad, that is a fucking cult, man. What to speak of, you add on top of that, surrendering to a guru, giving up your autonomy, 
one of the other basic human needs. Oh, man. Okay, so we have all the same cult, cult sort of engine, but what we have now, which makes it more dangerous, is the exterior of a non-cult. Whereas before, everyone could see what it was. It was clear what you were joining when you joined that. Now, people were young and stupid, and when you're young, you don't have experience. You think you're invincible. You don't, you know, you're not able to think. You just can't project yourself into the future to understand what the consequences of your decisions are. But at least at the time, you weren't taking people's autonomy away, right? So for Kant, um, moral theorist, Immanuel Kant, um, you know, lying to people was such a really, really bad thing to do. It was, he considered it, in fact, the sort of fundamental moral sin, you might say, because what what morality really requires us to do is treat other people as autonomous rational agents that's what it means to be human is to be an autonomous rational agent when you deceive someone you are taking away their humanity because what does it mean to be human to be human is to be able to make a rational autonomous choice for ourselves. but when you lie to someone you take that away from them when you mislead someone you take that away from them you're denying them their essential humanity it's a really serious moral transgression to manipulate people in that way. And it's not on accident, right? It's being done on purpose for the purpose of manipulating people because they know that is the way to get people to join. It's fucking cult bullshit. There's no other way to describe it, to say it, to talk about it. Okay. Rant over. <laughs> and uh, I'll talk to you all soon. Cheers.